reading obituaries of players I'd watched as a kid, Ollie Matson, Bobby Coombs, after their great moments had been chronicled in these obituaries, in the last few paragraphs, there'd be mention of their difficult final years with dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. It was then too I began reading about players who died well before their time. Mike Webster, Bob Probert, Junior Seau. These names started to seem to go on and on, week after week, month after month. All this made me think about history. I'd been a history major in university, and about all the big questions that we'd gotten wrong in the past. Slavery, the absence of women's rights, and about some of the more current issues like tobacco, lead, asbestos, drinking and driving, and how many times I'd wondered about the people of those times. How could they have gotten it so wrong? How could they have been so stupid? But then, also thinking that about 25 or 50 years from now, how will people look back on us and, and, and think about something? How could they have been so stupid? But about what? We'll always get some things wrong, but what are the big ones, the ones we can't get wrong? In hockey and sports, I think it's head injuries. I think people in the future will look back on us and say, how could they have been so stupid? What becomes the new instrument that is the most dangerous instrument on the ice, it's no longer the stick. It was always the stick. That's what you always feared, that the players would use, it, use their sticks on their opponents and, and it's like clubs and the injuries that could follow. The most dangerous instrument on the ice is no longer the stick. It's the moving body. That's the, the, the dangerous instrument. It is when you've got a body that's a couple hundred pounds and moving at that particular speed because you're moving at that sprint speed, and you collide, and if you collide with the most vulnerable part of your opponent, which is the opponent's head, then the rest becomes the real problem. For us, we think awareness is enough. We hope it's enough. It has to be enough. Scientists, media, citizen activists, we have to think that if we lay out the story clearly, conclusively overwhelming, then those who are decision makers will take this awareness and apply it. What else would they do? Except, most often they don't. So, we generate more awareness, and more. We build a mountain of awareness so high it is unmissable, impossible not to act upon. But, doesn't turn out that way. So I decided to give it one more crack, to write a book, but to write it in a certain way. This wouldn't be about awareness. It would be about creating the conditions and circumstances necessary so that decision makers who had always made certain decisions would make better ones. That's what game change is about. I knew too what my loudest credit critics would say, what they would inevitably say. The game is the game. It's the way it was and always will be. It's a tough game. You can't change the game. Who do you think you are even to imagine something different? I knew I had to take these critics on head on. You think you know the game? You like to think of yourselves as traditionalists, purists, keepers of the game. Well, let me tell you the real story of this game. McGill, 1875, a bunch of rugby players. Let's start there. And let's trace the story of this game that can't change because of course you can't change the game. And oh, by the way, did you know that for the first 50 years of this game that can't change, until 1929, you could 
not pass the puck forward? <laughs> and the questions, where do we go from here? And more importantly, how do we get there?